Hi there, it's Dr. Nigel Guillaume, Lead GP Training Programme Director for St. Mary's Scheme. I thought I'd do a brief presentation on strategy on how to optimise your AKT revision. I really hope you find it useful. Feel free to join us on the Facebook support group Mentor MRCGP. I've been a trainer now for about 17 odd years, a GP Training Programme Director for about uh, 14 years and teaching for the MRCGP for around 17 years or so. I was also previously an RCGP examiner, having worked for the college between 2003 and 2007. I've run many courses for the AKT. I'm just going to talk through some practicalities. If this is your first time of approaching it, you can only sit uh, from ST2 onwards, a maximum of four attempts. Um, register with the RCGP via the Pearson View and do run through the demonstration tutorial. Um, there's also a scratch pad, which you can use. And I'm going to tell you what to write on it to ideally optimize uh, your pass in the AKT, specifically around the statistics aspect. There are 200 questions, um, 190 minutes. So that's about um, one item um, with just less than a minute to answer it. Online calculator also. No one likes taking exams, especially the AKT. Uh, it's a pretty tough assessment. Uh, if you look at the pass rates over the last few years, they are unfortunately lower um, compared to a CSA RCA pass rate with a differential pass rates also, um, which currently have been the, the, the case for, for, for several years. Um, that will often reflect in terms of approach to technique. And that's really what I want to focus this presentation on to help you optimize your strategy. AKT myths are lots of books, handouts needed, lots of subscriptions. Can it be crammed for? Is question recognition enough? And all of these are, of course, false. The take home message from this is that this is firstly a college exam. So when examiners are devising questions, they are really looking at college resources. What we want is the college answer. We don't want necessarily a commercial bank answer. It will take about two months really to get this right. A little bit every day is much better than trying to cram it all in at the end. Um, in terms of strategy, can you spot hot topics? Absolutely, you can. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that now in terms of how you prioritize, how you focus. It is about practicing these sorts of questions every day. Again, it's not commercial bank questions that we are looking for. It's college type questions uh, so that we can apply the right technique in problem solving. 80% medicine, 10% uh, admin, management, organizational aspects, 10% research, statistics, and specifically extrapolation of risk from plots. Weakest areas tending to be around recent evidence-based medicine and statistics. The AKT summary reports are absolutely central in how you pass this. So the summary report is produced by the college after every AKT sitting, highlighting areas which have not been performed well by candidates and are very likely to appear in subsequent AKT sittings. In terms of the resources, uh, central knowledge updates, which you can freely access uh, uh, from the college website, along with the challenges. So these are free banks of questions with explanations that you should be attempting. Uh, in association with that, you have RCGP e-learning modules around certain chronic conditions and hot topics. And the RCGP self-test, which is free for you to access as an AIT, should be attempted at least twice before you attempt the AKT and certainly before you look at any commercial bank. Why is this important? Well, you simply need to read uh, some of the AKT summary reports. If we have a look at AKT 17, uh, where diabetes was an issue, it is specifically highlighted that it's very likely that similar items will appear in subsequent tests. So the college are trying to highlight through the AKT summary reports areas that you need to strategize, prioritize and focus on. How far do we go back? at least two years, ideally. Um, just for the brevity of this presentation, I'm gonna be looking from October 2020 in the lead up to the October 2021 AKT sitting. So statistics has been highlighted as a weak area, specifically the candidates did not understand the central differences between absolute and relative risk and had issues with extracting risk from plots. In terms of admin aspects, health and safety, pre-employment vaccinations has appeared a number of times. And then we have our uh, clinical areas, for example, gynecology, drug dependency, as well as other topical areas as highlighted. January 2021, pre-employment vaccination. Again, neurological symptoms in terms of clinical topics. We have 
from a um, managerial aspect, uh, safeguarding, specifically looking at children and adults, that reflects the fact that as STs for ARCP, you now have to obviously undertake mandatory uh, child and adult safeguarding with updates every single year. So that's very, very important. And then uh, April 2021, uh, transgender issues, GMC guidance uh, around this, capacity and consent in children, which has appeared many times, diabetes, again, you can see here in this context, insulin regimes, and being aware of the sorts of regimes that might be used, uh, the basal bolus regime, for example. Uh, there's been a, a number of changes to oral contraception, dermatology images, uh, uh, very topical also. There's now a much more detailed report looking at uh, AKT Fairback from the last uh, five years. would really recommend you have a look at that to see the areas that tend to feature quite heavily. You can see leadership and management. You can see children and young people, uh, dermatology in terms of images, mental health, and metabolic problems and endocrine issues, respiratory health. So this is a very, very interesting area. Um, I'm often asked, which guidance should I follow? Should it be nice? Should it be signed? Well, let's go back to the college. Um, what would they tend to favour when looking at the AKT? Would they just tend to favour nice? Uh, sign? Would they go, well, we're going to look at nice for the assessment, um, making a diagnosis and maybe sign for the treatment of that diagnosis? Or is it conversely sign for the assessment and nice for the treatment? So the answer to this is, is both. It has to be both. Um, the answer is actually going to be C. And the reason for this is quite interesting. Obviously, the AKT applies um, whether you are studying in England or in Scotland or in Wales. And if you think about what's happening in Scotland, um, where we have sign guidance, uh, which prevails, the reason for that is because NICE aligns to QOF and QOF was abolished in Scotland. So uh, when it comes to looking at the college resources, you need to be aware that actually you need to know both guidelines. And sometimes the college will tend, if you look at their essential knowledge updates, to weigh a bit more heavily uh, in uh, one guidance compared to another. Now, the AKT summary report, which was published several years ago, did highlight this. It says that we are aware that there are contrasting guidelines that exist in a number of clinical areas. One national guideline does not automatically trump another, and that is taken into account. However, we recommend that candidates are aware of the areas of consensus and the areas of discrepancy between major guidelines. And that can be a huge area to cover for different medical uh, conditions and problems. Uh, we do this in a very strategic way on the full day AKT flagship course, where we look at the Sentinel guidelines and give you uh, easy aid memoirs to help you remember the similarities and the differences in case you're tested on both of these uh, during an AKT. If I take a prime example, osteoporosis, um, essential knowledge update, firstly published in 2015, updated much more recently, 2021. Uh, if you have a read of the EKU update, this evidence update differs from the existing NICE clinical guidelines, um, which focus purely on assessment while SIGN makes treatment recommendations. So that's the basis of that question that we saw just previously in terms of what the RCGP might tend to favour when it comes to certain medical conditions. Again, this may not apply to every single medical condition, but you need to be aware of the areas of consensus, the areas of discrepancy. So you have to play by the rules. That means not just looking at the AKT summary reports, it means going back to the source, the essential knowledge updates, the RCG e-learning modules and the RCGP self-test. So let's just take a couple of examples in terms of strategy. So clinical topics, you saw that neurological uh, and neurological referrals are very topical based on NICE guidance that came out a couple of years ago, which three of the following presentations warrant an urgent two-week review. I'll just have you read that uh, briefly. Um, is it going to be A, a rapidly progressive ataxia, B, a gait apraxia, C, loss of smell sense for more than three months, D, repeated transient smell, taste hallucinations, E, blackout not due to a vasovagal attack, F, facial anodynia, G, a Bell's palsy, or H, scalp tendons with jaw cordication? The answers, A, D, and E. And what the answers are reflecting are essentially trying to spot conditions such as a space-occupying lesion, um, a, a vascular event, and making sure that we're not missing something along the lines of epilepsy. In addition, 
other presentations that would warrant an urgent two week review include rapidly progressive limb weakness, recurrent brief pattern altered sensation, persistent limb altered sensation, and brisk reflexes. And how do we source this back to the RCGP? Well, if we have a look, you will see an essential knowledge update January 2020, specifically looking at suspected neurological conditions, recognition, and referral, which reflects the updated uh, NICE guidance around this topic area. COVID, very important. Um, if we start looking at when this has started to appear in AKTs, you need to always be aware of the updates that are coming through. And there is a COVID-19 resource hub on the college website, which you must have a look at in preparing for the AKT. If we move to statistics, what do you need to know there? 20 questions, online calculator. 20 questions can feel quite a lot because often what will happen is you'll be fluxed with the information that's coming across in terms of graphs and figures. You have to be able to break it down in terms of risk. And that's why it's been highlighted so many times that if a candidate is not aware of the central differences between relative and absolute risk, they're gonna find it very difficult, not just with equations, but actually risk extrapolation from plots and graphs. From risk, you can calculate numbers needed to treat. You can start looking at screening. Uh, values, um, interpreting, calculating odds ratios, confidence intervals, looking at different studies. Uh, and only then really, once you have a firm understanding, can you look at plots, scatter larvae, cates, forest plots. Um, we cover all of these on the half day powerhouse stats course, also on the online uh, AKT webinar, in addition also to the full day uh, flagship course. Cates plots are really topical. If you have a look at the college website, uh, there's a document which you can download, which highlights a number of different plots. Unfortunately, they don't go through the explanations, which isn't very useful. Um, it's really as a basis, as a tutorial for study groups, uh, but we work through these uh, on the courses. Case plots are all based on risk. Um, it might just be worth talking a little bit about risk, because actually, if you look at the scratch pad, really the equations that should be going down should all encompass risk. Risk is the probability that something bad's going to happen. You can only work that probability out if you're moving forward. So it's a prospective measure. Um, it can be given as a percentage or as a decimal form if we look at the absolute risk of, for example, of failure in the AKT. What we would do is follow the number of people who take the exam, that's the total number of people, and then we would look at the number of failures. It's the number of failures over the total number of people. If we apply a treatment, our aim is to reduce that risk, in which case we now have two groups, an absolute risk and a control group, also known as the control event rate, and an absolute risk and a treatment group, also known as the experimental event rate. Uh, the absolute risk reduction being the difference between the two. Treatments sometimes don't reduce risk, they can actually increase risk, in which case we are no longer dealing with an ARR but an ARI, uh, which is given by your ART minus your ARC. An absolute risk is a risk which is attributable to the individual, that's the most important thing to take away. Uh, when we start thinking about a relative risk, which is also interchangeable as a risk ratio, you are comparing two groups. So if I looked at the relative risk of an event in a treatment group compared or relative to the control group, it is given by this equation, relative risk, uh, ART divided by ARC. My relative risk reduction, how much uh, my treatment reduces risk relatively in one group in comparison to another given by this equation here, one or 100% minus our relative risk. Numbers needed to treat, the number of people we need to treat to prevent one bad thing from happening. That's the reciprocal of our ARR. Again, be wary of how you are putting that risk out. Is it as a decimal? Is it as a percentage? If your treatment's causing harm, then rather than a number needed to treat, you're now looking at a number needed to harm, which is the reciprocal of your ARI. When it comes to relative risk, because it's a ratio, if that equals one, there's not going to be a significant difference between treatment and control groups in terms of risk. So again, really important we understand these central differences between absolute and relative risk before we start number crunching, before we start looking at plots and graphs. If you want to be looking at how we extract risk from a case plot, do sign up and subscribe to the Mental MRCGP YouTube channel where I've done a, a, a little presentation on case plots, talk you through risk extraction, talk you through an example. Ultimately, what we teach you to use is that scratch pad, that very useful scratch pad on the day, getting your risk uh, calculations down so that you don't have to recall them an hour into the exam when your brain might be a bit frazzled because they are just there. We teach you how to extract risk from case plots. 
we teach you how to look at odds ratios, calculate odds ratios, we teach you equations around screening, we teach you the fundamentals of absolute versus relative risk, and we look at all these different plots um, that can come up. So finally, if we look at admin organizational, you have seen that pre-employment uh, immunizations have come up a lot, very, very topical. Receptionist due to start work in your GP practice, which two of the following immunizations are required to be up to date before commencing work. Is it A, BCG, is it B, DTP, is it C or HEP B, D or MMR, E, influenza, F, men C or G, varicella? Answers, B and D. The other immunizations are not routinely needed for non-clinical staff. Where do we reference this from? It's the Green Book, Chapter 12. Interestingly, not being updated um, quite yet to take into account um, whether COVID vaccination is going to be mandatory for non-healthcare uh, workers. It's advised currently, if you have a look at it, it's just been updated quite recently, but not mandated. So again, always very important to go back to the source to make sure that you're aware of these updates. So in summary, use that scratch pad strategically, start thinking in terms of hot topic coverage, what has been prioritized by the college in terms of AKT summary reports, reference back to EKU, essential knowledge updates, challenges, GP self-test. If you wanna take this further, we have our mental AKT full day flagship course which covers all the topical areas uh, highlighted by the AKT summary report, starts looking at the sentinel differences uh, between the guidelines. You are sent an extensive pre-course paper with lots of AKT type questions, which we will work through uh, during the day, justifying how we've reached the answers together in small groups. Um, there's an extensive uh, handout, which is given to supplement that learning um, in addition to the pre-course paper. Uh, you also have access as a special offer to the Mental AKT Online Statistics webinar, which covers and consolidates your stats technique with a few more additional questions around risk extrapolation and plots. If you want to sign up to that just separately, then it's uh, £30 for 30 days. If statistics is particularly weak for you, then we run a powerhouse stats half day course, really boiling down to the fundamentals of risk, breaking down those plots. And about a week before the AKT sitting, um, I often run a plots booster course over Zoom being for that £20. Uh, all the courses are HEE accredited to London and KSS. Um, if you're unsure, do check with your own deanery before applying. My contact details are there. Um, so feel free to keep in touch with me uh, from that respect if there are any queries about the course. But if you do check the website, everything's detailed there as to what we as to what we cover. We cover a lot, but we do it in a very fun, interactive way. And most importantly, we centre the learning around patients. So it's not just about um, knowledge recall, it's about actually taking this information back and applying it straight away to patients that you might see in clinical practice. And that then takes us on to our next clinical exam, which is the RCA, which some of you might be thinking about. Um, run now a number of courses over lockdown to VTS groups, to trainers, uh, different workshops. Um, we do uh, half day powerhouse courses, we do full day, uh, one day courses, uh, which are limited to six with lots of RCA targeted simulation, case calibration and marking with professional uh, actors. And again, all of these RCA submissions are based on previous RCA submissions which have been simulated. So none of it is generic, no role play, um, which is kind of being made up per se. Um, also offer um, uh, ongoing one-to-one -one support and in addition, some online resources around uh, strategic RCA case selection, uh, marking, and also have a bank of face-to-face -face role plays um, uh, which are important as we're now moving back to face-to-face -to -face consultations. Hope you found it useful. Don't lose hope. Really, really important. But before hope comes strategy. Very important that if you've been stung by this exam before, please think about your strategy. There's a big difference between working smart and working hard. Do keep in touch. Mentor MRCGP uh, via the Facebook group, uh, Twitter. Do check the website for uh, up-to-date course details and bookings and really look forward to seeing you on the course. Best of luck, do take care, bye now.